play, to work, to visit, to breathe. Now is not the time to give up. We are stronger than this virus. When it's your turn, roll up your sleeve and stick it to COVID. What I miss is uh, being out there, coming through the gate and getting ready to play. I miss uh, the noise that Ryder fans bring. If I was talking to Ryder fans, I would say, get your shot, be ready, because we're going to have a football season, and we need you in the stadium. If you ever had to look a child in the eye that's relying on you to protect them, would you say, yes, I will protect you? And that's essentially it. I will get the vaccine, I will protect you because you can't protect yourself. Because I will do anything at all costs to protect my daughter. Getting the COVID-19 vaccine for me will be a huge priority. I want to do everything that I can to keep my... Thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, today we will have <coughs> uh, Rural and Remote Health Addictions and Seniors Minister Everett Hindley, as well as Saskatchewan's Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Sakib Shahab, and SHA CEO, Scott Livingstone. We will start with opening remarks from Minister Hindley. Thanks. Good afternoon. As you know, our goal is to vaccinate a significant portion of Saskatchewan's population as quickly as possible. And while we still have a long ways to go, there is one segment of the population where we have achieved this goal. And that's seniors living in our long-term care and personal care homes. Our healthcare workers have now been to every one of these homes administering first doses, and to most of them with second doses, with just a few more to go. This was our highest priority when we began receiving vaccines. This has been an extremely difficult year for those seniors and for their families. We have all seen the tragic results that have occurred when COVID has entered seniors' homes across Canada, including a few here in Saskatchewan. That's why we've had to enact very tight restrictions on visits to long-term care and personal care homes. These difficult but necessary measures have meant seniors in those homes have been significantly limited in their ability to visit in person with family members, in some cases for over a year now. And this had to be done to protect our seniors, but it doesn't make it any less heartbreaking. I can tell you as the Minister for Seniors, this is by far the number one question and the number one phone call and letter and email that I have heard and had come into my office. When can we visit our mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle in the long-term care home? Today, thanks to the great work of our vaccine teams delivering shots to seniors in those homes, I'm very pleased to be able to answer that question. If at least 90% of the residents in that facility have been fully vaccinated and three weeks have lapsed since the last second dose vaccinations, then starting on Thursday, April 29th, one week from today, long-term care and personal care home residents will be able to welcome up to two visitors at a time indoors and up to four visitors at a time outdoors. And it does not have to be the same two or four consistent visitors. 43 long-term care homes across the province already met this criteria and many more will qualify in the coming days. Seniors who are fully vaccinated will also be able to leave the facility and return without having to quarantine. We have said many times the road back to normal is through vaccinations and I think today's announcement is just a small glimpse of what that looks like. We still have a long way to go down that road. So no, we can't fill up Mosaic Stadium just yet, 
but some of us can go see mom on Mother's Day, and that's a pretty good place to start. But it is just the start. It's one small step in getting back to the people we love to see and the places we love to go and the things that we all love to do. And there is much more to look forward to. But the way we will get there, in fact, the only way we will get there, is if we all do our part when it's our turn and roll up our sleeves and get vaccinated. Earlier today, the vaccine booking eligibility age was lowered to all residents ages 44 and over. The booking system has experienced significant uptake, resulting in high demand for a limited supply of appointments, particularly in our urban centres. While some clinics throughout the province still have uh, some appointment times available, a number of clinics, including in Regina, Saskatoon and other locations, are currently out of appointment times. We understand the frustration that comes with not being able to immediately book an appointment where you live when your age group becomes eligible. This is the unfortunate result of not having enough vaccines. But I would like to assure eligible residents that as we receive more vaccines from the federal government, more appointments and opportunities to receive your COVID-19 vaccine will become available. This includes booking appointments through our mass vaccination system. It includes reopening our drive through vaccination sites. And starting early next week, Saskatchewan residents will be able to access the COVID-19 vaccine in several pharmacies across the province. To start with, we are anticipating that 61 pharmacies in 13 communities will begin accepting appointments through their booking systems on Monday, April 26th and a few pharmacies uh, may even start to book as early as tomorrow. And pharmacies in these communities will begin vaccinating residents on Thursday, April 29th, with more pharmacies expected to come on board in the coming days and weeks. So, while we wait to receive more vaccines from the federal government for drive throughs and vaccination clinics, we are asking for patients from Saskatchewan residents and know that we are working to make a vaccine available to you in your community as quickly as possible. In the meantime, let's all keep protecting ourselves and those around us. Keep following all the public health orders and guidelines. Our case numbers and hospitalization numbers have started to trend down just a bit. The public health orders are working, the vaccines are working, and the end is in sight. This is the first COVID briefing that I've done. And so I just want to thank everyone in Saskatchewan for everything that you've done over the past year. And I want to especially thank our healthcare workers, those on the front lines treating COVID patients, the massive team we now have delivering thousands of vaccine shots each and every day in every part of Saskatchewan, and everyone else working in every part of our healthcare system looking after Saskatchewan people every day. So thanks everyone. And when it's your turn, stick it to COVID, and please get vaccinated. Dr. Shahab. Thank you, Minister. So uh, I will start with again expressing my sympathies to the friends and family of the five Saskatchewan residents who have lost their lives due to COVID-19 since we last talked on Tuesday. Um, on the other hand, you know, I would, uh, you know, echo uh, Mr. H Minister in this um, uh, comments that, you know, resumption of family visitation to long-term personal care is such a good news after this long year. And it sh really shows th the way of what we can achieve once we get vaccinated. And we hope that this will expand not just to long-term care, but as Minister said, to visiting our close friends and family uh, in, uh, in, in increasing with increasing confidence over the next few months. But again, uh, we have to do two th things over the next you know, six to eight weeks. We have to get vaccinated as soon as our turn comes and the enthusiasm is reassuring actually that when you know, booking slots go run out within you know, a short time of becoming available. But I think we need to make sure that we find the earliest slot we can when our age group becomes available. And we need to continue to uh, follow public health guidelines in areas where we live to keep our numbers low. I think that is going to be critical to make sure that our health system is not overwhelmed, uh, our vaccine clinics run smoothly. And then once all of us are vaccinated, uh, those of us who choose to get vaccinated 18 and older, um, you know, we can look forward to um, you know, relaxing those restrictions 
as we see case numbers go down and hospitalizations and ICU uh, uh, rates come down as well. Um, we, uh, again, you know, uh, investigations are ongoing with uh, the cluster of the P1 variant. We may find some additional uh, contacts linked to that cluster, which we expect to see. And, um, you know, um, some there's been some travel restrictions from international travel due to new variants of interest emerging throughout the world. And that is going to be our reality for the next, you know, few weeks um, as uh, all of us uh, step forward to get vaccinated. And, and at the same time, you know, we need to recognize that it's been a hard year for our seniors in long-term care, um, but the vaccination rates are remarkable, 90% plus in many long-term care facilities, 100% uh, in many personal care homes. Um, in the community, 80 and older, 85% um, uh, plus vaccination rate, higher than 80% uptake in 70 and older, 60 and older are, you know, coming up. And, and now as uh, you know, 50 and older complete the vaccination rate and 40 and older access vaccinations. And of course, uh, from next week, persons younger than 40 who uh, work outside the home and in essential workforces uh, access vaccinations. We need to keep this momentum going so that everyone 18 and older who choose to get vaccinated gets vaccinated. And if we have a high uptake with every age group who's eligible, you know, that will ensure that we can gradually come out of this pandemic. And for young people who may become eligible, you know, over the next, you know, uh, if you're 18 and older, over the next, you know, three to four weeks even, you know, please watch out for when you're eligible and get vaccinated as soon as your turn comes. And for person, for youth under 16 who are not yet eligible for vaccination, I just want to recognize it's been very hard. Uh, this whole year has, has been hard. Uh, sometimes you can't meet your friends the way you used to. But again, the weather is great. Uh, you can do lots of things safely outdoors where you can maintain your physical distance, uh, wear a mask if you can't maintain that two meter distance. But you know, please do continue to take advantage of the outdoor, but do be careful not having large gatherings outdoors or indoors with sharing of food and other items because we have had a super spreading event in the Southwest uh, where we have now 40 plus cases linked to that, unfortunately. Uh, where normally if you had a gathering of 10 um, and not following protocols, you would have two or three individuals with variants, you get eight or nine out of 10 infected. So again, we just need to just be patient for the next four to six weeks, stick with our public health guidelines. And of course, as our turn comes, uh, get vaccinated as soon as we become eligible. And I would agree with Ms. Uh, Mr. Hindley that, you know, sometimes it can be challenging when you don't get a booking at, right away, but uh, many of my um, uh, 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 people I know who initially said they can't get in, they were able to get in uh, for a later date near where they live. So the system does, uh, you know, reset and uh, adjust uh, very quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shahab. Thank you, Minister Hindley. We'll now move to questions. We'll start with our first question on the phone lines. We have Lara Farmanoff with CKOM. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I guess my question would be regarding uh, the age eligibility and the uh, vaccine rollout right now. I'm just wondering, perhaps this question is for um, Mr. Livingstone. Why was the late age eligibility lowered um, right now when there are so few vaccine? Uh, when, when there are so few vaccines, uh, we've heard stories of people being number 500 on a phone line, number 200 on a phone line, not even being able to get through and being told you're simply going to have to wait. So why lower the age eligibility at this point when there's not around? Scott, maybe I'll, I'll start with that and then you can weigh in a little bit as well. Um, it, it's a great question, Laura. Um, you know, I, I think the reason that it was it was done is because uh, there are a number of uh, communities uh, in the province where, uh, you know, there were still vaccines uh, available. Um, you know, if, if you look at at, uh, at the map uh, in certain communities, you know, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, you know, there's, there's a, we're out of vaccines in communities like, like Regina, uh, like my own in, in Swift Current, uh, but there's some smaller communities, rural communities 
that still had vaccines um, sitting on the shelf, and but people not uh, uh, in a position to to take the vaccines because they, you know, uh, the, the people living in and around these small communities um, haven't met the age requirements. So I, I think that's, you know, part of the reason there, but uh, Scott might want to expand upon that a little bit further. Sure, thanks, Minister. And just to highlight, you know, one of the reasons we continue to drop the age categories is exactly why the minister has pointed out is there is available vaccine and available appointments, not in all communities based on uptake, but also to remind that some of the specialized targeted vaccinations, uh, particularly in Regina and other areas of the province where we've been able to bring the age um, level down means that there's there's communities in the province that are have already vaccinated younger individuals. And what we're trying to do as we bring on pharmacies uh, and prepare for the, the increase in shipments of vaccines that will occur soon, that we're actually keeping the province at uh, relatively the same age rate across the province, excluding some of those special interest groups like our extremely uh, vulnerable uh, essential workers, et cetera, who also need to protect it. But it's also at the same time as we bring on pharmacies so that we're moving through uh, the first doses as quickly as possible and not confusing folks with respect to the messages around who is eligible and bringing that to the to uh, the public as quickly as we can. As the Premier said many times, if we didn't have, if we had all the vaccines, we, 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 uh, we would require to vaccinate the population, we'd have no criteria. But it's important to actually equalize that age group uh, across all of the vaccination sites, including the new uh, community pharmacies that will come online next week. And that's one of the reasons for dropping it. Uh, and we will continue to book appointments out um, and make them available as new vaccines become available. Do you have another question, Lara? Yes, please. Um, I guess this is for the minister. Can you clarify whether the visitors to uh, care homes also need to be have one or two vaccinations and whether uh, there's any concern that if they don't have any vaccines, if there's no requirement for a vaccine, they may uh, reinfect or reintroduce COVID into long term or into care homes? Yeah, uh, my understanding is no. Uh, you know, if the resident, uh, you know, as we've said today, has has received both their first and second doses, and and it's been three weeks since that second dose has has taken uh, or has been administered, that they do not, that the visitors do not have to uh, um, uh, have been vaccinated. Um, you know, uh, but that being said, uh, you know, the, the public health orders uh, uh, and all the measures that uh, still have to be followed in terms of, you know, um, you know, mask wearing and uh, temperature checks and screening and all that, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, that's uh, that, that's uh, in part of it as well. Um, you know, th there there is always a risk that, you know, that there. Uh, for for you know COVID nineteen to you know to, to get into a facility, there's no one hundred percent guarantee. But you know we've reached this this uh, um, time here where where a vast majority of of folks have have had uh, that vaccine. It's been you know uh, one hundred and seven days since uh, uh, Jimmy Fable and Isla Lacrosse became the first long term care resident to get a to get a vaccine, and uh, it's been a long time that that families haven't been able to uh, spend time uh, with their loved ones, and uh, whether it's parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles. And, and you know, as I said in my earlier comments, it's, it's one of the uh, most frequent calls that, that, that I've been getting to, to my office under this, under this part of the, the portfolio. Um, I've talked to folks back home, how tough it's been um, to, to not be able to, to, to spend time with, uh, with their parents and not to be able to see them except for you know, compassionate reasons uh, only. Um, so that's been very, very challenging. But uh, you know, we've uh, worked very closely with Dr. Shahab and, uh, and Dr. Shahab may want to offer some, some additional comments, but uh, uh, just in terms of uh, where we landed today and, and what, we're, what we're allowing at this point uh, going forward. We'll come back to the room. Wayne Mantico with CTV. in some centers uh, are you considering or do you have the capability of increasing the number of beds uh, thanks Wayne uh, I'll just start off a, a little bit with that and then uh, ask uh, uh, Scott I guess to comment on it um, uh, the ICU situation is a concern of course um, you know uh, we're we're monitoring it very closely and something that uh, myself and, and Minister Merriman and you know the Premier uh, and others that have uh, conversations with with officials uh, uh, several times a day just in terms of the overall health care uh, system and, and what's happening uh, out there so um, you know we want to make sure that uh, it's you know as 
as the minister and, and the premier have said, this is a, a it's a very difficult balance that we're in right now. We're trying to get people that's vaccinated as quickly as we can because we know that will that will have a, a positive impact on on the new cases and prevent people from from uh, you know hopefully ending up in a hospital or, or taking up an ICU uh, bed because uh, you know of, of some serious outcomes. So it's something that we're we're very well aware of. And, uh, and Scott, you might want to offer some some comments on just the capacity with within the system. Thanks, Minister and Wayne. So, so we've talked a lot about how we've been working to expand ICU capacity provincially, which has always been part of the initial plan. But as you've heard me say too, you know, the system is not working as it normally has, not for non-COVID patients uh, or COVID patients. We, we are putting and stresses on the system that are unprecedented, particularly in Regina, uh, where we're, uh, you know, on bypass. We have a, a, a number of people in ICUs across the city um, concerns around what happens if that happens outside, but we are working hard to expand capacity. We have added 38 additional ICU surge beds province-wide and, and have used other spaces, as you've heard before, like critical care spaces uh, for cardiac patients to uh, use as overflow in ICU. We've been doubling up patients where we've needed to, uh, which is not normal. Lots of stress, frustration, and, uh, and tired staff uh, across the province, but in particular in Regina, where they are feeling the very, very brunt of this. Um, with respect to other bed capacity, uh, to expand COVID capacity, Wayne, as you know, we have been doing service slowdowns uh, across the province, and in particular, more service slowdowns in Regina uh, to accommodate more patients. We've opened up more COVID units in our facilities to care for those patients that aren't in ICU. Uh, but but certainly the system is under stress uh, without a doubt, uh, and this is the most significant stress we've felt uh, through the entire pandemic. Do you see need to, to increase capacity? Is that under review, and is that even possible at this stage of the need? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Oh, sure. I just want to know if you are then considering increasing the number of ICU beds. Um, and maybe in Regina, Saskatoon in particular, is this under review? And is it something you could even consider doing? I think I noticed a story from a year ago where you initially planned for, I believe it was 211 ICU beds. So that would leave one to believe that maybe this is something that could be done if we're so close to capacity or at capacity. So, so Wayne, I just want to be clear. We've already expanded ICU beds. Um, we've gone from our typical 79 uh, to add another 38 and we're currently running at a high level of capacity within that that number so we usually run at 79 we have over 96 uh, patients I think as of this morning in ICU across the province that's not just COVID patients because our ICUs also need to take care of those people from you know cardiac events strokes uh, accidents so we've already aggressively expanded beds we will continue to try to do that uh, we have, as you know, bought equipment and uh, beds. We've talked about this lost, lots on these news conferences over the last uh, one year. But the challenge we're having is to have the right number of skilled staff, and we, we, we are struggling to have uh, that occur. We don't have, you know, we were, we're not going to have unlimited ICU capacity, and we are stressed, particularly in Regina, more than we have ever been uh, throughout the pandemic. We'll take another question on the line. We have Zach Becerra with the Star Phoenix. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my first question is from Minister Henley in regards to the relaxed, relaxed measures in terms of long-term and personal care homes. Um, I'm wondering how these are going to work uh, on a more regional basis. There is the asterisk here that regional medical health officers can make determinations on whether restrictions need to stay. I'm wondering if that's going to be the situation in Regina, for example, given what's happening there right now. And also if that might be the situation if there are a certain number of staff or residents of long-term care homes who do not want to be vaccinated. Right. Uh, thanks, Zach. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of the measures, and you correctly pointed out that uh, there is a note that uh, you know uh, we'll be working uh, care homes, long term care, personal care homes will be uh, working with with the local medical health officers because if there you know if there is a, an area perhaps where where there's in you know increased cases, for example, um, there will be a determination made as to as to uh, you know whether or not uh, you know we can proceed with uh, this in these areas, but. Um, you know, um, 
keeping in mind, I think that uh, you know we know that uh, that this is something that's uh, important uh, for people. We know we need to continue to make sure that uh, we're we're protecting uh, you know all of our all of our residents and including those that are that are most vulnerable. Vulnerable, but um, you know we've we've also been hearing that uh, you know that people uh, this has had. The, the restrictions that we put in place in terms of visitation, long-term uh, care homes and personal care homes, and um, they've not been easy. They've been exceptionally difficult for for the residents, uh, for their families. Uh, and, and again, I've I've talked about some of the phone calls that I've taken, and they're they're not easy phone calls. And uh, you know, and and nor are the ones where where people have have passed away as a result of COVID-19. But um, you know, this is a reasonable step to to take. You know, we've we've always said uh, since the beginning that uh, you know. Uh, our, our goal throughout this has been um, to, you know, try to protect the healthcare system so it's able to do its part, but also to be able to protect the most vulnerable, uh, which, you know, in this particular uh, instance, uh, in this case, it's it, it's an age-based uh, thing by and large. You know, the older the you are and if you have, you know, if you're immune compromised, uh, the greater chance are that uh, there will be negative outcomes as a result of COVID-19. So um, it's why we've, you know, prioritized uh, uh, from uh, the top down in terms of ages, working our way down and making sure that we can protect uh, those residents but people are, you know, they were also have also been asking, you know, when at one what point uh, can I see uh, my, my grandparents or my parents in a long term care home? At what point can we start to visit again? Because uh, they've heard us as a government say it's important to get vaccinated, and that is that is very true. That is the only way um, we'll get out of this is is making sure that everybody uh, gets vaccinated. And and we're fortunate to be able to say that, you know, for the most part, we're we're at that stage right now with long term care homes. You know, there's I, I believe uh, 43 that are that have hit that. Uh, that benchmark of of uh, both first and second doses and three weeks since the second dose and there'll be more care homes coming on board in, in, in the coming days and weeks that will have uh, reached that benchmark as well so um, it, it's an important thing I think for people uh, but recognizing of course we still have to balance it out with you know with the public health measures that are that are still in place uh, um, with respect to to what's happening around the province. A follow-up question Zach? I do. My second question is for Mr. Livingston. Um, Scott, you mentioned that Regina's ICUs are under unprecedented strain this point in the pandemic. You said in the previous con uh, press conference that if what happens in Regina uh, plays out in other regions of the province, then we are in big trouble. Can you walk me through exactly what happens if the rest of the province gets hit as hard as Regina, and if at that point we have to start, start talking about triage and care, for example? <clears throat> So thanks for the question, Zach. So certainly based on the, the pressure in Regina, if that was to expand to other areas of the province uh, because of the aggressive spread of the variant, certainly we would be in a situation province-wide where we would be struggling with uh, caring for both COVID and non-COVID patients that are in emergency or critical care situations. There's just no doubt that that would be the case. And with respect to um, you know what it, what it looks like and with respect to the ethical framework if, if we're in one of those situations where we are have exhausted our ability to expand icu both from a staff perspective and providing safe care we move into that that area that i would describe more as a, a mass unit where patients are being triaged and decisions are being made by clinicians using that that framework to uh, appropriately care for the people that are, are more likely to to benefit and that you know, that's not just COVID patients. We have, you know, elderly individuals still in this province that have been vaccinated that could suffer heart attacks or strokes or get in car accidents or, or, or be in some form of traumatic event that require critical care. And, uh, and, and that would, would stretch the system beyond. So to give you an example, Zach, although we're not formally using the framework today in Regina because of the capacity challenges around ICU surgeons are making decisions on a daily basis on what patients we can take to the OR because typically those types of cases where they're open heart or aortic aneurysm or other serious types of surgeries, those patients end up in ICU after their surgery and we're actually not able to maintain our, our usual daily uh, types of surgery in that space because we just don't have the ICU beds on a daily basis to accommodate that. And we'll take our next question. We have Laura Sharpletti with CBC. Hi there, thank you so much for taking my call. Um, this is uh, probably for uh, Dr. Shahab or, or Mr. Livingstone. Um, I, have a, um, I have 
a story that I'm writing about a man who uh, he has lung cancer uh, and uh, it has quickly spread to his brain. And um, he was supposed to have surgery this week to remove the tumor, um, and it's spreading quickly. Um, but now uh, they just learned t- today that because the ICU beds are over capacity, he can't get the surgery. So what I want to know is, you know, what is the province doing to to really focus on helping these critical care patients that need treatment now? I know we spoke a little bit about it, but just what what is being done to really narrow in on the people who need surgery now but can't because of the ICU situation? So, so I think I've already touched on that, and Dr. Schraub, I'll take that question if you're okay and if you want to follow up. So like I said, every day, uh, particularly in Regina, decisions are being made to appropriately triage patients and to um, provide their surgery where we can safely do so. And if that requires an ICU bed, we're limited capacity right now. That said, there are also still some options uh, available to us because it's not what Regina's experience is currently not the the state in, in uh, for example, Saskatoon. So if there was an opportunity, if somebody was stable enough to receive a critical care surgery in Saskatoon, they may transfer. But this is exactly what I'm trying to say is with respect to the pressure on the system right now from COVID patients in ICU and, and non-COVID patients in ICU, we're already in a situation where we're making those decisions on a day-to-day basis uh, and triaging the most uh, priority, high priority patients that we can uh, to make sure that we can care for them safely and provide them an ICU bed that they would need post that surgical procedure. Do you have a follow-up question, Laura? Yeah, I do. Just a small one. I'm going back to uh, the um, visitation being opened up for long-term care homes. Um, this is for Dr. Shahab. Um, did you recommend this change at this point in the pandemic? Yeah, thank you. So I'll maybe make a few comments about the visitation for long-term care and then a few comments about the ICU search from my perspective as well, if I may. Uh, So certainly, you know, absolutely like the minister said, you know, we were looking for any opportunities that we could uh, allow visitation in a safe manner. And, you know, we um, uh, certainly have looked at evidence from other parts of the world, uh, Canada and the US, and certainly uh, the approach we have is a very safe approach where once you have a high vaccination uptake in a long-term care facility, uh, you can safely start visiting as we have described. Uh, Having said that, I do want to say that many, many people that I I know who have loved ones in long-term care have gotten vaccinated because if you're 50 and over, you're already eligible and they have received the vaccine. So that provides an additional layer of of protection. Many staff members have gotten vaccinated and that uh, uh, provides an additional layer. Uh, If you have any concerns before visiting, because you may have been exposed uh, or may have any concerns, getting tested, testing is widely available. If you plan to visit your loved ones in long-term care regularly, and especially if you haven't been vaccinated yet, yet, get tested on a weekly basis. And if you have had one dose, but think you may get exposed every now and then, again, consider getting tested. I think those are all additional mechanisms we can do over the next little while. Um, And certainly the hope is that as more and more of uh, the people who visit regularly are vaccinated, one dose and then increasingly two doses, you know, further, uh, you know, uh, the visitation guidelines would be further relaxed. But I think we're starting in a, in a very careful way, but it is, you know, all of our responsibility to get vaccinated, to not just protect ourselves, but to protect our loved ones, our family, and at the end of the day, our community, because our community transmission numbers are also uh, reflected in how quickly we take up vaccinations. And secondly, uh, further to the issue with I- ICU numbers, if we want to reduce the pressure in ICUs in Regina and throughout the Saskatchewan by next week, we need to take specific measures today, which we discussed last time also. If we can work from home, work from home. Many people since uh, Tuesday actually uh, said to me that, you know what, they reviewed what kind of work they do or uh, or what their employers do. And many have started working from home um, because they can work from home. Similarly, you know, reduce your number of unnecessary visits uh, out and about, you know, do your grocery shopping, one person going if they can uh, in a systematic way when it's less crowded, very carefully using takeout and curbside pickup, minimizing a number of contacts, uh, enjoying the outdoors in a safe manner. All these actions today can result in reduced ICU pressures next week. 
And we have already seen a plateauing of case numbers in Regina, re rest of the province. But you know, we need to get those numbers coming down, increase our vaccination uptake, but also do everything we can today to see those numbers coming down by next week. Thank you. If I could just add there too, just to the to the uh, first part of the question about um, um, the, the number of, of homes that have uh, that will be eligible in this first uh, batch, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's about 43 long-term care homes that have vaccinated over 90% of their residents in three weeks has has lapsed. Uh, there's still about another uh, 115 long-term care facilities that, that have not met these requirements just yet. Um, every long-term care facility and personal care home has been offered a, a second dose. It's just a matter of waiting for this three week uh, time period uh, after after the second doses and um, in, in terms of uh, so people uh, I believe the SHA will have the information on on which facilities because this is going to be on a facility by facility basis but the SHA I, I understand will, will have that information uh, on, on their dashboard I believe and uh, and how it will work is once the once the SHA has confirmed um, that a, a long-term care home has 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 met the requirements uh, then they will uh, allow that uh, facility to, to notify a residents and and families that the restrictions have been in eased in that particular facility. So it'll be fluid as, as more and more of these uh, long-term care facilities uh, come on board. And we'll take another call on the line. We have Mark Smith with CTV. Hi, I've spoken with a couple of people from Regina today who attempted to book vaccine appointments um, and ended up booking them in Weyburn. Um, with travel advisories in place uh, for Regina to not travel in and out unless for essential reasons, um, why are people allowed to book vaccines outside of the city and should more vaccines be made available in Regina to ensure people here can get vaccinated? Thanks, Mark. Um, and I'll maybe ask Dr. Shahab to, to comment on this a little bit uh, as well. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good point. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's there's a number of uh, uh, communities that, uh, uh, at least as of earlier today, when I was checking, that had uh, uh, appointments open for or for vaccine appointments, and uh, probably some of those are, are now uh, gone just because of because of the the demand. Uh, um, and it's uh, something that's you know a, a good thing that we have uh, people wanting to get these vaccines, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's through a drive-through or an appointment-based or a walk-in clinic. The demand has has been has been very high, and it. it it is a challenge, but as we've said many times, this is how we're going to get back to normal. It's how we're going to get back to, to being able to announce things like we're announcing today, where we're starting to ease restrictions to allow more visitors to, to go and visit their, you know, their loved ones in, in, in uh, long-term care homes and personal care homes. It's allowing, uh, in addition to that, it's allowing those, uh, those residents to be able to leave their homes, to go out and, you know, go for a walk in the park with their family or, you know, go for, uh, um, you know, uh, at lunch at a restaurant uh, in, in communities where they're they're allowed to do that right now so um, you know that's uh, an important uh, uh, part part of this uh, um, but I'll maybe let Dr. Shahab talk a, a little bit about um, uh, vaccines and in, just in terms of of uh, people traveling uh, for for that outside of their community um, thank you so you know my recommendation would be that you know it's better to get vaccinated as close to your home community as possible and obviously um, the, the booking system gives you a few options near where you live. Obviously, the way the vaccination clinics run are extremely safe. And if you um, obviously go to a neighboring community, um, because that's the closest clinic, uh, you know, the way they're set up is that as long as you only go for, to, getting, to get vaccinated, um, you know, uh, the, the way they are set up minimizes any risk of transmission to the host community. Um, but generally, uh, and I'm sure Scott will confirm that, you know, generally uh, as these supply and demand, um, you know, surges, you know, the adjustments to volumes of vaccine and appointments will all, always keep adjusting. Thank you. Mark, do you have a follow-up question? Yes. Um, how are vaccines allocated throughout the province? Um, how is it determined how many go to certain communities and could that be adjusted with communities maybe seeing uh, less people booking there uh, to have more allocated to cities like Regina and Saskatoon. Scott, do you want to uh, talk about some of that in terms of the logistics of, of vaccine uh, rollout? Absolutely. And I was, I was going to add to that last question, Mark, but, but certainly 
throughout the immunization program um, with an age-based model, excluding those targeted uh, individuals, which we have many now, essential workers, healthcare workers, um, you know, other frontline caregivers, uh, our focus on long-term care residents in the far north. But other than that, the, the distribution of vaccines uh, across clinics was done looking at uh, a number of factors. Uh, and, and initially it was also looking at the resurgence or our high levels of uh, COVID cases in certain communities. So for example, the AstraZeneca, the first AstraZeneca drive-through we did in Regina was done explicitly because of uh, the, the growing number of cases in the COVID variant to, to um, give more individuals in Regina an opportunity to be vaccinated to try to get in front of uh, some of the, uh, the variant cases. But overall, how it's done is, is a, it's a fair, transparent process, which actually looks at communities across the province and the number of individuals uh, by age group that would qualify for vaccine and then distributing the vaccine based on that basis. Now that said, there have been instances throughout the program where we have made adjustments um, you know, to, to vaccine um, allocations to communities uh, where, where we can and there is available vaccine because we know we have some high uptake and as you know in Saskatoon and Regina where we're in Regina in particular where we lowered the age groups quicker than we did elsewhere. Uh, so, so with respect to um, an ongoing basis we're monitoring it um, on, a, on, a, on a literally a, a four day window now instead of booking out uh, two to three weeks in advance as we get new vaccine but the really the rate limiting factor to getting people vaccinated in all communities is the supply of vaccine. But we've been using the same methodology and applying the age-based uh, um, criteria and, and allocating vaccine to communities that way. But we have moved vaccine to your point, Mark, uh, when it's not being used. And we have a seven day window uh, at the SHA uh, through our immunization program. So once vaccine lands in the province, uh, we're expected to deliver that within seven days. So we have made adjustments to do that. Uh, if it's looking like some communities we're seeing a little slower uptake. Thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. That concludes our availability.